My name is Kevin Jones. Uh, I'm a global product specialist working for Nginx. Uh, I help support all the sales engineers uh, working for the company. Um, but I've been involved in the sales engineering space and, and kind of helping uh, guide the roadmap uh, for Nginx over the last few years. So thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, it's great to have you guys. How's the conference so far? You guys enjoying it? Yeah? Good content? Awesome. Um, it's always exciting. So this is actually my fourth Nginx Conf, and it always amazes me. Like every year, like people continue to come up with new great content for the con for the actual uh, breakouts, and uh, the product's just really growing so much. So it's really exciting to have everyone here and be a part of it. So, so thank you guys. Uh, my agenda today is really to to talk a little bit about Nginx and caching, why and how. Uh, really just cover the basics and situations of basically why you want to cache and, and you know, what makes sense to use Nginx as a cache and why. Uh, talk a little bit about fine tuning it. Um, it's, it's not necessarily the definitive guide on how to tune your cache particularly, but it's just some kind of uh, recommended ways to uh, fine tune that cache. And then also just tips and tricks that I've learned along the way just as being a user of the product. Um, before I came to Nginx, I was a, a system administrator, site reliability engineer, uh, and I was commonly troubleshooting Nginx. So I got a few tips that, that I kind of give you there. We're gonna talk a little bit about high availability caching with Nginx and what that kind of looks like and what we recommend. And then just to wrap up, we'll just do any questions you guys have uh, about, about my slides. So uh, I have a lot of slides. I probably have like 50 slides, which is probably more than I probably should. So I tend to uh, over slide my deck. So if I go through the slides too fast, um, I'm more than happy to kind of chat with you guys afterwards about anything that, that I had. Uh, we're obviously going to record this, and I'm going to give the slides, um, and they'll be available um, on SlideShare. So if you need those, just come to me. Uh, my email is really easy. It's kevin at nginx.com. I'm an open book, so you guys have any questions, shoot them my way. So why and how? So I mean, really, uh, Google really changed the rules. I, I kind of like this quote. Um, you know, we want you to be able to get uh, from one page to another as quickly as you might turn a page on a book. So that's that's pretty high expectation. I don't know about you, but I can turn a page on a, on a book pretty quick, right? Um, and you know, they kind of set the stone for uh, where we needed to be from an application performance uh, standpoint. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to cache. Obviously, performance is number one, right? Um, you really want to offer the fastest uh, you know, response time as you can for your applications. Caching is a really great uh, way to do that. Um, uh, whether it's static or dynamic content, uh, it's a great, great use case. Consolidating your infrastructure. Uh, I've, I can't talk to, I've talked to so many companies that have been able to really like downsize their environment from almost uh, 10 times lease uh, less amount of servers on their back end just by enabling caching. So caching can really drastically improve uh, uh, or consolidate the infrastructure in your environments. High availability. Uh, you know, no one likes downtime, right? Um, and downtime is not, uh, in this day and age, you don't want to have a, a, a page not loading because uh, there's a good chance that you have a competitor, someone's going to go to your site. If it's down, they're just going to go to the next competitor. Same good example is Uber and Lyft. Uber's not working, I'm going to open up Lyft, right? Lyft's not working, I'm going to open up Uber. Um, we're just in that, that day and age where high availability is really important. Also, lower downtime. Um, this kind of goes the same with high, with high availability, uh, but it's really being able to be reactive uh, with your um, uh, environment and lower that number as much as possible. So Nginx can help. That's really the, the main point of this conversation, right, is we can help cache static and dynamic content. We can help improve uh, uh, performance of your applications by doing micro-caching or, or uh, uh, by caching those responses. It can also serve stale content while revalidating to help performance. That's a, that's a feature I'm going to talk about. You can also use Nginx to control the cache and override what maybe your application developers are doing. Uh, maybe they're trying to control private resources that you feel could be cached. We, Nginx gives you that uh, control over the cache environment. Uh, and then Nginx Plus has a cache management API as well. So uh, if you need to be able to uh, delete and manage the cache on the fly, you can quickly query that API to invalidate the cache. So Nginx is perfect, right? You can build a CDN, and this, I, I had to throw this slide in. So I was like looking through cat photos, and I found this one of the cloud, and uh, I thought it was perfect. So Nginx is perfect for both on-prem and in the cloud, right? You can easily uh, build a CDN anywhere. Uh, you can build it on, a, on an on-premise situation where you 
just want to have a CDN localized to your actual data center, or perhaps your multi-cloud strategy using Nginx, you can actually uh, build your CDN on Amazon or on uh, Google Cloud or whatever cloud provider you, you decide, and in that sense, it's agnostic, right? Uh, Netflix is one of uh, uh, the biggest examples of an on-prem CDN that they built. Uh, the problem they were having is that, you know, they were having multiple vendors, you know, contenting, uh, caching their, their content, uh, Akamai, Limelight, Level 3, just a few, and they were just struggling to really keep up with the amount of data and the amount of video and being able to still uh, serve, uh, you know, reliably and quickly to their, to their customers. It was getting expensive because they were having to go through these uh, vendors with, you know, they had they a large amount of data and they were getting charged based on the data uh, and they didn't have any control over the environments. And so their solution was actually to create their own CDA, CDN using Nginx, FreeBSD, and some other OSS stuff. And they actually built appliances, uh, 14 terabyte rack units that they actually gave to the ISPs for free just to load and, and run in their, uh, their data centers. Uh, and this really put them at the edge, right? Because if every single data center had literally their own caching solution. It was, in my opinion, it's one of the ultimate CDNs that is used by Nginx to this day. And you know, they still actually do their own caching on-prem uh, in, in their own cloud. Um, and they have a lot of different layers of caching and it's all built around Nginx. This gives better experience, reduced cost, uh, reduced CDN fees. So overall, Nginx is a huge win for, for uh, Netflix. Also, PBS, one of our uh, biggest customers, you know, they're using Nginx, this is just a quote from them, but they're using us, same, same kind of scenario, web application firewall, cache, and a proxy. Uh, the nice thing about Nginx is you can do a little bit of that, or you can do a lot, lot of that. Uh, you're able to really consolidate your layers, right? Um, and that's a perfect example of what PBS did, is they built a proxy layer that had the caching running in it and the web application security. And so they could easily consolidate their layer into one, one, uh, one layer. So the content, uh, the idea is pretty simple if you don't know. Uh, this is just a review for, for people. The idea is that some kind of request is coming through the internet. At some point it's hitting a cache server. More, more than likely you're hitting Nginx. Uh, a lot of CDNs are, are built on Nginx. Nginx essentially is checking to see, um, it, it, it basically uh, has a cache key that you define in the configuration, which is typically the full URL uh, and the request that you're trying to get with all the, the URL arguments by default. And then it's hashing that and it's looking in memory to see if that uh, response is already available as a cached asset. It's also checking other things like headers to see, uh, uh, that I'm gonna get into a little later, but cache control headers from the client, how it should behave and stuff like that. Uh, and then if it doesn't have it, it's gonna go to the origin, the origin's gonna respond and then Nginx is gonna cache that response on disk, right? So pretty, pretty straightforward. That way the next customer comes in for the same file, boom, it's already ready, they can already check um, to see that it's there. So setting it up with Nginx is actually really easy out of the box. Uh, if you haven't set up caching, the first thing you have to do is tell Nginx where on disk that you want to store the cached at, uh, assets. So it's just a path on disk. You also specify the actual key zone. So if you're familiar with Nginx, you know we use shared memory zones. Uh, you specify the actual location or the name and the amount of data that you want that cache key size to be able to grow to. And then you can set like uh, max, max size parameters for that location, which is the maximum amount of uh, uh, size that that uh, cache size should get. And then you can also set an inactive timer. Um, the benefit to doing that is Nginx will automatically try to uh, manage that cache for you. Uh, using a process that we'll talk about in a little bit. The next thing you need to do is you need to set up a cache key, right? That's common. So as I told you before, uh, the default is going to be the, the, the scheme that you're using, so HTTP or HTTPS. It's going to be the host name of the upstream of where you're pointing Nginx to, so the origin server. And then it's going to be the full request URI, which is the, 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 all the path and then any arguments that are appended to that. Now that doesn't mean you have to use that. The, the nice thing is it's fully customizable. So you can base it off of a cookie, you can base it off of a header, uh, you can base it off of a, a unique argument, you can strip out the full URI and maybe only just use the localized URI, right? So it really gives you the flexibility to cache only what you want um, and, and, and cache and control what is cached uh, and what is considered a unique cached item, right? Uh, then all you have to do is really just reference that in a location. So. Uh, because Nginx is all regex based and all the location matching is done you know, using um, regular expression, you can have individual caches for individual parts of your application or parts of your services. So you, maybe you want to cache video and you reference the large cache. If you want to cache images, you reference the small cache. 
Uh, and all that's doing is referencing the virtual uh, memory that you're using for the shared memory zone. Uh, you also need to tell Nginx how you want it to behave with the cache response as well. So uh, the nice thing is you can define exactly what kind of status codes that you want Nginx to cache, and then you can also tell it how long. So you can say, hey, I only want to cache 200s and 301s and 302s, and I want those for five minutes. But pictures, let's go ahead and just cache any kind of status code that comes back for another period of time, such as an hour. So it really gives you that flexibility to really control uh, certain uh, types of things um, in your environment. So that being, done, that being said, pretty easy configuration, right? Uh, this is just a standard basic caching config, nothing fancy here. Uh, so really you only need three directives to get going. Uh, when you do set up caching, so if you're not running, if you're not doing any caching, these processes will not show up. But if you enable a proxy cache, uh, we have two extra processes. One is the cache manager, and one is the cache loader. So the cache uh, manager is basically going to periodically check the size, the max size, and it's also going to periodically check that um, uh, the inactive timer on the on the actual assets that are being stored in there, and then as needed, it's going to clean that up for you. Now it doesn't constantly do it, and it doesn't do it right on the dot. So if you have a, a one minute for your inactive timer. Not every minute it's gonna go in there and clean up, but it's gonna do it when it feels that it has the necessary resources available to do that. So it's very efficient in that sense. Uh, the loader is going to be only loaded for a short period of time, really, when Nginx first gets, gets going and starts up. And then what that's doing is it's basically taking all of the cache that's on disk and it's loading it into the shared memory zone. So if you have to finish next for some horrible reason SIG faults, or has uh, the server needs to reboot, uh, all those cache keys are gonna get rebuilt and loaded into memory at the time that it's reloaded. So, very efficient. Um, there's lots of other things you need to be aware of when it comes to cache control. Most importantly, I think the number one uh, issue that I come into with customers that are trying out Nginx for caching is they always can't, uh, don't take into account cache control headers. There's a bunch of them, and they're kind of important and they're good to know. I'm not gonna go too much into the, into the details of this just because of time, but um, the important thing to know is to understand these and what they do. You know, there's, there's cache control headers from the actual origin server, and then there's actual um, headers that are passed and managed between Nginx and the origin server. And so I'm gonna go into a few of these that are important, uh, but most importantly, I'm gonna show you how to ignore these when you need to. Um, you might try to set up caching and get, get it all going, and then you'll find out that, hey, it's not caching, why is it not caching? And that might be because the backend is coming back with a cache control private. So Nginx is going to, um, it's going to, uh, it's going to listen, to, uh, look at these response headers from the origin server, and it's going to behave accordingly according to the RFC, right? So if you have a private resource on the back end, and Nginx sees that, it's not going to cache it because it's going to assume it's private. So you actually need to override that, and so we'll sh we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, expires deals with like the the actual uh, time in which something is considered stale. Um, last modified tells the uh, server when that file might have been modified in the last you know, certain amount of time. E-tag is like in a unique figure, fingerprint for that file. So there's different ways that Nginx looks at this stuff, and we'll go into that just a little bit. Um, the first thing you might wanna do, as I told you before, maybe you don't want to worry about origin servers cache control headers. You may want to just ignore them, okay? So you can use the proxy ignore headers to do that. Um, and you know, like I said, example would be private, no cache, or set cookie are all good examples of when Nginx is not gonna cache that response unless you ignore that header. Um, we can fine tune the content a little bit more um, than what I showed you guys before, and so we're gonna get into that now. Um, I kinda like to show this. This is a real uh, high level overview of types of content that you typically see flowing through Nginx, right? Um, the number one use case for Nginx in the past for caching has always been static content, video pictures, HTML, JavaScript, all the, all the little files that typically don't change too often, maybe during a big release or something like that, you'll have to go through there and maybe they decided to change the logo or something like that on the application. And then there's this stuff on the right, which is like user content. Like it's only specific to me. You know, I'm gonna go online, I'm gonna put in my uh, uh, user ID, right? We're not gonna wanna cache that stuff for other people because they're not gonna be using my user ID, right? Um, some kind of shopping cart data that's unique to me. No one else needs to use that. But then there's this stuff that's in the middle that is kind of dynamic in nature, and it, it might be like a blog post, uh, it might be uh, an API data that maybe can be a little bit stale or can be a little bit uh, uh, out of date. 
Uh, and that's the stuff that is constantly being updated on your back end, right? Um, and by constantly querying a back end, you're going to overload it, uh, especially if it's like a really large API payload. And so by enabling caching, and micro-caching is what we call it, for even a very short, short period of time on very high amounts of load, you can see dramatic, uh, dr drastic change in performance and improvement in performance. Um, to do that, there's some things you need to consider. So the first is you need to use keep alives, okay, uh, between Nginx and the origin server that you're trying to communicate with. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to keep that TCP connection open on the back end, um, and it's not going to have to go through there and re, you know, renegotiate um, that TCP connection. Uh, to do that, it's pretty simple with Nginx. You enable keep alives on the upstream. That's going to keep up 20 connections to that back end. Um, we also do some micro-caching settings in the configuration. So we don't need a big cache, so 100 megabytes is fine. Um, it, let's just say it's a real small JavaScript that we're uh, caching. Um, there's a good chance that you don't really need to worry about the size of that because it's going to be constantly updating it every second, which is what we have set here. Uh, also, the inactive timer can be really low because, we don't. again, we, we want Nginx to just kind of clean it up in a, in a lower amount of time. So all we're doing is caching for one second and then the last stuff here that we're doing is we're actually enabling uh, two things. We're, at, we're proxying and telling Nginx to proxy on HTTP 1.1, which is a requirement for Keep Alive connections. And then we're telling Nginx to not send, uh, or to send a connection header, uh, not to send connection close, basically to send an empty connection header. And so what this is gonna do is keep that connection open. Make sense? So final touches. So there's a little bit more you can do for micro-caching. Um, there's a really cool feature that was added, I think, about a year and a half ago. Uh, but this allows you to do, uh, tell Nginx to do a background update. So this is really nice when it comes to micro-caching because what it's going to do is it's going to, uh, instead of, um, uh, it's going to basically do a sub-request, right? and update that expired cache item. So if, if it's an expired item, like the client is trying to connect it and we know that Nginx says it's expired, it's gonna reach out, grab that, and then it can still serve a stale version to the client. Um, it's pretty, pretty nice. And so to do that, um, you actually go here and you use proxy cache, you use stale. So um, not only do you have to tell it here to do a background update, but you also have to tell it to, do, to use the stale. So there's a lot of other options on this. Uh, updating is the one that you want to actually tell it to, to serve a stale when it's in the process of updating, which isn't here, but I'll show you in a second. And then you can also do other things like check for an error. So if there's an error, serve a stale version. If there's a timeout, serve a stale version. Or if there's a certain HTTP upstream response, s serve that stale version. So this really gives you high availability of certain assets. Uh, so you know, if contact us is, is one of those assets and you want them to be able to go to there at least to see your phone number or your email address, you can have this available and set up. You can also turn on what's called the proxy cache lock. Um, this, is, this is new as well, but what it's gonna do is it's only gonna allow Nginx to populate that cache from the origin uh, um, one at a time, so one request at a time. So if two requests at the same time come in for the same file or the same uh, URI, Nginx is gonna update it, and then the other connection is just gonna hold it there until that update's done, and then it's gonna serve it to the client. So that saves on a lot of bandwidth to the back end, right? And it also saves on a lot of processing power of the, of the application. And so this is really important for micro-caching because you don't want to allow any more, ca any more requests on the back end during that second. You really want to optimize that. So overall, this is the last optimizations that you're adding. So you're adding background update on. You're telling it to lock it so that only one, one request at a time can populate that cache and then you're telling it to only to always serve a stale version if it's in the process of updating. So with these, these two things, it's kind of like the final touches for micro-caching. There's a good blog on our website, and it, it might be actually be a webinar, I think it's a blog, and it goes into like performance numbers on WordPress as an example, and we were able to see like 90% gains in performance just for a WordPress application by enabling uh, uh, micro-caching. Uh, but it's, it's, it's only going to be in situations where it's really, really high load. And that's, I think, what's most important to understand. Um, if you go home and say, oh, I'm going to put this on my, my personal homepage, set up micro-caching, it's probably not going to help you too much. Uh, but if you're getting you know, hundreds of thousands of requests a second, micro-caching is going to be the way to, to, to look at uh, optimizing that application stack. 
Um, so there's some further stuff we can do. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about proxy cache revalidate. Proxy cache revalidate is really, really nice because what it's going to do is it's going to enable Nginx to revalidate expired cache items by sending a conditional git request to the back end. Okay? So instead of actually doing a full request and expecting back the full body of the, of the response, it's first it's just going to send a, a, a conditional git with two headers, if modified sense and if none match. So it's going to pass across uh, what Nginx thinks was the last time that, that file was modified. And it's also going to compa uh, compare that to what the server responds with, with last modified. And then it's also going to send the e tag that it has for that actual file. So it's going to keep that. Um, and so that way, if those match, it's not going to need to get the whole request from the back end. And it's just going to serve it to the client. So revalidate is really nice um, because it saves on a, a lot of bandwidth on that back end. Uh, you can also uh, change the minimum amount of uses. Um, this is more like, comes down to cache ratio. Um, if, you're, if you have a, 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 a cache that's you know, one terabyte in size, um, and you're filling, up, filling it up with things that are maybe large files, maybe they're pictures, images, um, there's a good chance that you might be caching a lot of stuff that you really don't need to because it's not requested often. And so what you can do is raise this minimum amount of uses to something that makes more sense, right? So if you feel that more than 10 uses of a file in a given, uh, uh, since, and by the way, this is since restart of Nginx. So if you restart Nginx, this will reset. Uh, so that's always important to know. Um, so this can be tweaked up to as high as you want to. You can take it to 20, 30. Um, Interested to see what people think about this and how this makes sense because um, the idea is that you, and I'll get into it a little bit too as well, but the hit ratio is just wasted disk space. So it's all about optimizing your disk space. Uh, you can also tell Nginx what kind of methods that you want to cache. So by default, it's going to cache git and head requests. Uh, it's actually going to convert head to gits. Um, <laughs> so if, you do a, if you're ever testing at the command line and you, cr you do a curl and you do a head, it actually caches that. Um, and so there might be situations where you want to cache a post request, right? Um, you just have to make sure that you add the request method to the cache key, right? Because it's going to be a unique uh, request. And that's because git and heads are technically the same thing uh, with the cache key. So when Nginx, when you, when it automatically converts it to a head. So you do have to uh, define that, and so that's very important to understand. Uh, some more tips and tricks. So uh, this is just me personally. Logging is the most important thing when you're troubleshooting. Um, I always like to do a few things. These top three are the, the most critical. The request ID is a unique Nginx uh, hashed key, or like it's like a, a, a ID that gets generated at every single request. And so this can be really useful because you can take that and you can pass it down to your application stack, pass it to your origin server, you can log it, you can add it as a header, which I'll show in a second, um, and it really allows you to really trace the request. Um, and you can even give it to the client as well so that they can provide it to you as well in the form of a header. Um, and then I always log the full proxy cache key. So that way, if I'm uh, troubleshooting a cache and like this customer says, hey, I'm trying to get access to this cached item and it keeps hitting miss, 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 I can just look in the logs for the URI that they're, that they're trying to, to cache. Um, maybe they don't have the request ID. Maybe they don't know how to get it or something like that. I also log the cache status. So the upstream cache status is coming back with a response that tells Nginx how it behaved with the cache. So it's actually logged as a variable. So a hit, a miss, a revalidate, um, something like that is going to be show up in the logs. And so you can instantly see for that request ID, it was a miss, and this is the cache key. So that, that's just a little uh, logging best case. But as I was telling you before, you can add the request ID and you can add the upstream cache status as response headers so that the, that client that's coming through the, the CDN can give you those if you're trying to troubleshoot the cache. You might not do this in production, but it's really good in non-production if you're trying to work with developers or something like that. Uh, also, if you're using like curl to debug, um, you can see it right in plain view. Uh, so in this case, you can have multiple response headers, one for the request ID for the um, uh, 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 load balancer, one for the content cache, right? Uh, and then you can also uh, 
respond with the cache status. So if a developer's testing, they can see, oh, it's a hit, cool. It got, it got served from Nginx. Uh, if you're using Nginx Plus, um, we have an added API that's in Nginx Plus that has metrics. We keep track of the state of the cache. So that's just really whether it's been warmed up or not. Uh, if it's cold, that means probably it's not getting requested or used at all. It tells you how much memory of the key val that's being used. It tells you the size of the cache, how much being, is being used. So you can see that disk usage that I was telling you about, the utilization. And then most importantly, it shows you the amount that's served, written, and bypassed. And it gives you that, that ratio. So obviously, the higher the ratio, the better. Um, if you're at 50% ratio, you're wasting 50% of your cache disk, most likely. Um, and you can kind of tweak those, that minimum uses, like I was mentioning. Uh, there's a bunch of data in, in controller. Um, so you guys have heard about controller, right? <laughs> um, there's a bunch of uh, metrics that get pushed into controller um, that are really important. Uh, the, the, the controller agent is grabbing um, all the cache logs. So if you have those, those uh, variables in the cache log, it's going to grab those, send them to controller. It's also going to grab all of the API data from Nginx Plus as well. So all that stuff I just showed you, the warmth, the, the size, the served, bypassed, all that stuff. And so this is all being sent to controller, and you can create custom graphs of the CDN environment or the cache environment. So that's, there's a lot to, to know there. But if you go into controller, you can create custom graphs on all of these metrics, which is really useful if you're trying to just see how your CDN is performing. Uh, there might be a situation where you want to punch through the cache, um, and this is like uh, the directive to do that. Um, Nginx can actually do a bypass, so it's proxy cache bypass. And what this is doing is it's looking for the existence of any kind of value in the, any of those variables. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm checking for a cookie with the name no cache, and if it has any contents, then I'm going to bypass the cache and fetch it from the origin server and, and serve it straight from the origin to the client. Also, you can check for an argument, name no cache, equal one, or no cache equal fresh, or whatever you want. Uh, or you can check for a header, a request header. So HTTP no cache equal one, or something like that. So there's a lot of flexibility to give people that maybe uh, don't want stale data. Right? Let's say you want to enable microcaching, but you have some kind of premium vendor that needs to get access to the data. Boom, give them proxy cache bypass. Um, we also have a, uh, I mentioned it before, we have a purge API. So if you, if you don't want to have to get onto the terminal or use some kind of like uh, tool to go in there and search uh, the cache keys and figure out what's old and what's new, this is great because you can actually ca uh, purge the cache based on the full request URI. Um, so if you're caching slash API slash V1 and you want to, and you're also caching API slash V2, you can come in here, hit the API only on V1 and V2 is going to be, remain completely unaffected. So it's URI-based. Um, and it also supports wildcard. So if you want to do a specific file, you can use the specific path with the actual full key. But if you want to do a slash star, so slash API, slash V1, slash star, then it's going to go through and search all of the cache keys and, and invalidate all of those so that the next time some request comes in, it's going to fresh, uh, grab the fresh version. Um, caching is not only for HTTP. Um, so obviously, if it's some kind of request on the back end that's maybe fast CGI, USG, SGGI, or maybe you're using memcached, uh, these are all things that you can use to cache the response. Um, so that's, there's a bunch of direct. So essentially, every time that we add a feature to HTTP, at least from what I understand, I think every single feature that's in HTTP cache is also added to all those other types of cache. Uh, high availability. So I'm going to rush through these a little bit just because of time. Um, but uh, the idea is there's two ways to really do high availability with Nginx. Um, and Nginx, particularly when it comes to caching, doesn't have any clustering fun functionality. And that's because everything is disk-based. Uh, so to really properly cache cluster, if you wanted to share and sync state, you would really have to copy the files. And so you know, we've thought about doing that. And I think that might be something that we're going to do eventually. But right now, there's two ways that we really highly can be used in a, a cache, sharded cache or a, a shared cache environment. Um, the first is that you have a direct proxy. So uh, this might be a situation where you have two layers of cache, uh, the first primary layer, the secondary layer, and everything is passing through both layers. 
So if a client comes through, hits the primary, the primary then queries the secondary, and then the secondary fetches it from the origin server. Uh, this way you have 100% availability, and if one particular node goes down, it can instantly be passed to the secondary node. If the primary server goes down, then it can uh, just go back to the origin server. And the way we do this is by using um, a backup option. So Nginx, if you have an upstream, you can set a backup. And so if origin primary goes down, uh, or I'm sorry, if origin secondary goes down, um, it will fail over and, and go back to the origin. Um, the trick here is that you just need to um, have some kind of way to do high availability in front of these clusters, right? So typically like a layer four load balancer or something like that is the recommended approach. Um, or doing active passive with like VRRP would be another method as well. Uh, you might want to shard the cache. Um, and this, in this way, it's not necessarily 100% available, uh, but if something does happen to one of the backend cache servers, you only lose that certain percent of the cache that's available. Um, the way that we do this is you have a load balancing tier and you have a, a cache tier, right? Uh, the load balancing tier is really just doing uh, consistent hash load balancing. If you're familiar with that, it allows you to uh, hash uh, the traffic or route the traffic based off of any set of variables that you want. And so what you need to do at this situation is set that consistent hash to the cache key that you're trying to use. So that way, if a request for a specific cache key or the URL or the URI comes in, it's always going to get routed to the same cache server, right? And so this gives you a distributed uh, cache. Uh, no backend is going to have the same identical item, and so it is sharded in that sense. If particularly in this, in this type of uh, setup, if one goes down, you're losing 25% of your cache, right? So the more cache tier you have, the larger cache tier you have, the more percentage of high availability that you have in this scenario. And this is really for like large amounts of data, you know, where it doesn't make sense to have just one disk. Um, you really just need to have like, like if it was for video, right? This is probably the way to go if you're doing really large video files, especially as today, video files are just getting bigger and bigger. Even though compression is good, sometimes people don't want to compress it too much. So the idea here is you can um, you know, cache in a, in a sharded approach. If one particular node goes down, the consistent hash is going to uh, you know, just toss it to another server. At that point, it's going to get cached again. So you don't really lose too much availability at that point. Um, and then you could combine stuff too, right? So you could combine the load balancers and the cache together and do all the load balancing and hashing in, in the middle as well. That works. It's a little messier, in my opinion, with the config, but a little harder to troubleshoot. So I was like, I'm always a fan of having two layers of something, so I really can you know, keep those separate, but it's, it's definitely possible. Uh, and then also, like, you could do something like this, where you have a hot tier, and then a, a, a kind of a cold, not a cold tier, but like a warm tier. And so stuff that needs to be really at the edge, you know, that's really important, you can put over there in this cluster, stuff that's maybe like images, pictures, yada, 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 stuff, that, stuff on the back end. Um, usual traffic you can keep in that warm tier. Uh, I recommend, uh, we have an ebook about how perform, high performance caching that goes into more detail than what I, I went into. Uh, I only had 35 minutes. My talk last year was like an hour and five, so I tried to consolidate a lot of this in, but there, there's a lot of good content in here. Uh, it was written by one of our, our engineers here. He's really, really smart about caching. It was a lot. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, at this point, I just want to see if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So we got three minutes. Any questions? Sure. Do you have a microphone, by the way? Anyone? Um, so you can. Um, you could mount memory as a disk in Linux. Um, that's the recommended way. <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately, the from an Nginx perspective, that's the only way to do it. We don't have any other way. At least that I know. Yep. Uh, you support uh, cache eviction strategies? Cache eviction strategies? Yeah. Uh, give me an example, sorry. Uh, allow you or uh, specifically use configure that? Yeah, yeah, so I don't know if you saw, but you can, uh, Nginx is gonna do that automatically. So if you have, if, if you have a, a timer or a certain amount of time that a certain response needed to be cached, it's constantly watching that to see if anything falls in line with the, the list of things to clean up, I guess you would say, and then it's gonna go there and uh, delete that stuff. Is that what you mean? Yeah, okay. 
Any other questions? Yeah. How easy is the cash manager process in terms of uh, the work that it does? You run the next work that you model, you want to give some advantages to this, right? So do you have some? I, I don't know 100, because I'm not, I've never looked at the actual source code, but from what I understand, um, is it actually will dedicate that uh, workload to a set worker or set of workers, if I'm correct. Um, I probably would need to ask one of the developers here. Um, but it, it's very efficient. Um, I've never really seen a support ticket where someone complained that it was too busy or it's not gonna get a spike in, you know what I mean, in CPU or anything like that. Um, yeah, so I don't think there's any performance issues with it at all. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yeah, so we do support byte range caching. Uh, that's a good, great question. I actually had a slide, I had to rip it out. Uh, but with byte range requests, if you know, it's just a HTTP header um, that contains the actual uh, range. So all you need to do is make sure that that header is defined in the cache key. Um, the trick is that uh, if, if you really are need to be caching the response from the upstream, and so we have upstream HTTP headers available uh, in Nginx. So at the time of the request, uh, it's gonna go through, it's gonna grab those variables, and you can use those uh, as a key in the uh, proxy cache key. Yeah. Well, so Nginx does actually have built-in range requests where it can automatically do it for you, uh, I believe, anyways. Uh, I, it's been a while since I set that up. Um, but yeah, if you were just hard coding the requests from the clients in range requests, then you would already know what those requests are gonna be and you could use like the request headers. Um, but Nginx is going to assume if you have a request range, that's a unique item. So, does that answer your question? Uh, not exactly. I'll follow up. We'll, we'll, yeah. <laughs> I saw someone else, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the use cases where Nginx won't cache if authentication is enabled, I believe. So um, I don't know if we have any best practices for that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't see any issue with that. Uh, if you, if you want to be able to include any of those headers and, and you want to cache just based on the authentication, like the token or something, it's fine. Uh, Nginx is owned by root, so unless you have root access to the server, there's no security issue there. Um, yeah, and anyone who says a normal user can't come in and read the the, the response, I don't, I don't, at least I don't think, unless they had access to, to root. So. I think that's it, because uh, we do have someone else coming on. But thank you, everyone, for coming. Appreciate it.